Well folks, this week's review is going to be a fond look back at a real hidden gem during the Ruthless Aggression era. In my opinion, one of the best B shows WWE's ever done in the last 20 years, and a real great showcase of the best of what SmackDown had to offer during this crazy time. I'm talking about Vengeance 2003 from July 27th at the Pepsi Center in Denver, Colorado. This show is one of my most nominated of all time. This comes to us from Jason White Jr., Bridget Martinez, Glenn Thompson, Bad News Black, Michael Lee, James Davey, and Majin BZ over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. This is the third vengeance of all time. Of course, I reviewed the first one from 2001. That was the very end, the tail end chapter of my invasion arc. You can check that out right here in the upper right corner of your screen. Like I said, the third vengeance all time. The first one to be a SmackDown exclusive pay-per-view. This was SmackDown's first brand exclusive show during the brand split, and we'll see what what they have to offer. 9,500 folks in the building here, 365,000 pay-per-view buys. I love the opening hype package here. There's this kind of sappy narration from the good guys in SmackDown, Brock Lesnar, Kurt Angle, Stephanie McMahon, Zach Gowan, how they're going to fight and live their dreams. Then Vince McMahon narrates the bad guy's side, and holy shit, he is evil. I am the dream killer, the reaper of souls. I am the only one who can see the big picture. Take your freak friend Kim with you. Michael Cole and Taz take us on this journey in the commentary booth. Your opening match is for the U.S. Championship Tournament Finals as Eddie Guerrero takes on Chris Benoit. WWE is bringing back the United States Championship around this time as a SmackDown exclusive mid-card title to counter the Intercontinental Championship over on Raw. And they had a big old tournament to decide who the first champion would be. And I love the final matchup in this bracket. Two longtime associates in Benoit and Guerrero. Guerrero is a very interesting case because at this point he is just turned heel, breaking up with his tag team partner Tajiri. They were the tag champions on SmackDown, but then Tajiri gets knocked off the apron, falls into Eddie's lowrider, and Eddie's all freaking out. At first we think he's concerned for his friend who got hurt. No, he just is mad that his ride got scuffed. So after he loses the tag belts, he takes it out into Tajiri and slams him through the windshield of the car. In the go-home SmackDown, Eddie admits to Benoit that he's not his friend anymore, that he can't stand Benoit, is always playing second fiddle to him, and this is his chance to beat Numero Uno, also, he sprayed some car wax into Benoit's eyes during that segment. On commentary, they're really putting over the history of the championship. They want to get this thing started off on the right foot, hence these two great workers in the final match. But I love they're going on about, they list all the different, you know, legendary names who've held the belt. Steve Austin, Harley Race, Sergeant Slaughter, da, da, da. Will these men, which one of these men will join that elite group of people who've been a U.S. champion? Like, yeah, like... Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero, who've each won the U.S. Championship in WCW. I love this whole opening sequence between them. Lots of sizing each other up, grappling, lots of cool roll-up counters. Benoit goes for the crossface early. Eddie escapes, but Benoit dives after him. Guerrero comes back with a Hurricane Rana off the top. Crowd is pretty pro-Eddie here, despite him definitely being the heel in this storyline. Benoit picking up the pace, lots of chops exchanged. Benoit with a top rope back suplex. Germans into the crossface. Eddie grabs the rope. Guerrero comes back, it's a superplex, goes to the frog splash. Benoit tries to move, but Eddie still gets it. That's why he always roll inside, I think. Big ass power bomb. We get another cross face. Benoit won't let go for a minute. Gets in the referee's face. That allows Eddie to tackle Benoit into him. Eddie grabbing the shiny new belt, laying out Benoit. Get the frog splash, the cover, but the kick out. Eddie grabs the belt again, thinks of what to do. He hits the ref with the belt. He plants it on Benoit and lays down. There's this great moment here where Eddie tries to to wake up the ref and goes back to selling. It's hilarious. Cross faces locked in again. Eddie taps. Ref still out. Another German. Benoit goes the flying head, but then Kyoto gets pulled in the way. As Taz says, Kyoto's getting his ass kicked in this match. In comes Benoit's friend and tag team partner Rhino, who promptly betrays his friend Benoit. Eddie's reaction absolutely priceless here. Hits the frog splash one more time, and he wins to become the first WWE US Champion. I give it four and a half stars out of five. This is my favorite match of the night. I love this thing. What a hell of an opener between two awesome uh, performers. These workhorses, working like horses. That's the vibe that I get from here. But not just that, it's Eddie Guerrero. His whole presence here makes this match for me and makes it like 10 times more entertaining. Uh, his mannerisms, the things that he does, the lion cheating and stealing on full display. If I had to show somebody like one match that really encapsulates Eddie's gimmick and like what made him so popular, 
popular and well liked, despite him being like a stone cold healer this time apparently, it would be this matchup, absolutely. Mr. McMahon seen backstage smelling the roses. In comes Stephanie and she doesn't want to hear any of Vince's claptrap or his fake concern over what happened to future Senate candidate Linda McMahon the previous week on Raw. Yes folks, this took place during a very special time in Raw's history when Kane had just been unmasked. He's going cuckoo bananas. To, he's beating everyone up, beats up Bischoff. He hits the tombstone pile driver on Linda McMahon and that's what brings out Shane McMahon and that's what gets their big feud going for the rest of 03. Anyway, Vince tells Stephanie he got her some flowers to make up for all the bad blood between them. We think it's the roses, but psych, he actually got her a tiny bouquet instead. What a heel. So after that great opening match, the technical masterpiece with Benoit and Guerrero for this new US championship and all the prestige that goes with it, take a hard turn over to the indecent proposal match as Billy Gunn with Tori Wilson by his side taking on Jamie Noble, the trailer park character on SmackDown during this time. He recently inherited $827,000 from his late aunt and he and his girlfriend Nydia are celebrating in style, living the good life. Nydia getting a genuine imitation mock mink coat to celebrate. Jamie has also offered Tori Wilson $10,000 to spend the night with her, which she and her on-air squeeze Billy Gunner against. Jamie keeps pressing, keeps upping the price, and finally Tori says that if he can beat Billy Gunn, then she'll sleep with him. SmackDown was supposed to be the more family-friendly show, correct? Jamie Noble comes to the ring with his love case. It's full of his sex oils and sex toys, as he says. Billy jumping Noble before the match, and he opens the case. It's like baby's first BDSM kit. What is this just slapdash cheap-ass looking collection of stuff they grabbed here? It's like they told one of the interns Here's $50, go to the nearest sex shop and just go crazy. Billy starts the match with a big feckin' tilt-a-whirl, goes for the splash in the corner, but he eats turnbuckle and Noble takes over. Taz talks about using sex oils and he manages to plug a sponsor while he's at it. Oh, you ever use sex oils? No. I, hey, uh, by the way, I use Casual GTX. Uh, dry hot, you know what I'm saying? Nydia arrives as Jamie works Billy's knee. She's not too happy about Jamie's proposal here. Gun comes back, hits the one and only, which Noble takes tremendously. Good lord, that height. Billy doesn't get the famouser, but he does hit the diamond cutter to absolutely no pop. Cole calling it a neck breaker. Noble comes back, hits a super DDT out of the corner. Somebody played No Mercy. Nydia puts Billy's foot on the rope. Noble's upset. Tori walks around, goes for a slap. Noble blocks and kisses her, which gets him slapped by both ladies. Noble avoids the gunslinger, pushes Billy into Tori. That distracts him enough for the roll up and the upset win. The reactions by Billy and Tori are great here. You can see Tori saying, holy shit. Taz saying Noble just won the biggest match of his career. What a time. I give this one two and a half stars out of five. The match itself was okay. This is a story that they could not do today and I'm wondering hmm, just how much of this storyline was Paul Heyman driven I have to wonder. He's the same one who came up with Tori Wilson and Don Marie and Al Wilson and that whole love triangle so I wouldn't be surprised if this was actually Heyman's idea as well but I think everyone involved despite that told the story really well. Uh, I love the way Jamie Noble sold for Billy Gunn, his amazing giant ass bumps with some of the biggest moves. And there's already the size disparity there, but Noble just makes it so much more exaggerated. I love that. Funaki, SmackDown's number one announcer, is backstage with the APA. Check out that pre JBL look on Bradshaw there. They're pre gaming for the barroom brawl. They show the clip from SmackDown on Thursday when all the other participants beat them up. APA give Funaki an invite as the Easter Bunny hops along. Damn that bunny! So that's the next match we have here is the APA barroom brawl invitational here. You've got Bradshaw, Farouk, and a whole bunch of people in the mid and lower card not doing anything of note, and they're thrown into here. I'll tell you the whole roster of this match in a moment, but I will say watching the bits with the APA backstage handing out the invitations on SmackDown has been pretty funny. Bradshaw at this point is like, I think, one of his most entertaining roles to me, pre-JBL. <laughs> Hey, Drain! Hey, hey, Drain! Hey, Drain! Hey, anyway! Hey, you guys got any extra water? Oh, yeah, we got plenty in Gatorade, too. Yeah, if you don't drink it, you'll die out here. Take care. Cramps are hard. I can remember as a kid, the Easter Bunny just totally dipped the hood, no. man. Yeah. Get a look at this rundown. You got the APA, the FBI, the Basham Brothers, the Conquistadors, played by Rob Conway, and the future Johnny of the Spirit Squad, Matt Capitelli, and John Hennigan from Tough Enough. Boy, that John kid looks familiar. Brian Kendrick, Orlando Jordan, Canyon's there, Funaki, the Brooklyn Brawler, Matt Hardy version one, Shannon Moore, the Easter Bunny, played by Damian Sandow, Doink the Clown, played by a pre-Eugene Nick Dinsmore, Sean O'Hare, Brother Love, and all the stars.
cars. You really keep up with all that. Right here tonight. Oh, yes. Gotta say, I love the set that they built for this here. The bar looks great. The saloon doors, the guys all enter in is pretty awesome. The wrestlers are drinking. Taz is drinking. Bradshaw on the mic saying the last one drinking wins. He leads a toast. He wants to get things started, but then Brother Love interrupts. He wants to lead a little benediction to spread a little love, making what I think is a weird priest sex abuse joke in the process. The two of you, when you were little, made two fine altar boys, yes. From the looks of things tonight, fellas, you've blown it. Brother Love begs for forgiveness for this. With one mighty swing of a stool, he takes out both conquistadors and the fight is on. Great moment where Sean O'Hare totally no-sells the brawler swinging a pool cue right over his head. Spanky is thrown to the table. O'Hare finally gets on a big run looking pretty impressive. He's doing far better than this match really needs him to be. Brother Love, who's been hiding the whole time, throwing Shannon Moore into a mirror and bashing a vase over O'Hare's head. Who booked him to be such a badass? Chuck Palumbo thrown into a part of the set. The bunny is out of here. Matt Hardy tries and fails twice to put Canyon and one of the Bashams through a table. Funaki, who's been sitting at the bar the whole time, is drunk and falls on his ass. Brother Love is cornered, gets dinged with a beer bottle, and the APA are the last men standing, but only Bradshaw is declared the winner. When did Farouk get eliminated? I give it one and a half stars out of five. You know, I mean, I'm not sure how much higher I can grade a match like this that involves such luminaries as the Easter Bunny, Doink the Clown, and Brother Love, but I will say, this was a big goofy brawl that had just enough highly entertaining moments throughout to keep me from looking away. I couldn't turn my head from this car wreck. It was very entertaining for me, even though as a match per se, wasn't much to it. It was just a big old brawl. Backstage, Jamie Noble Boy has a copy of Playboy with Tori on it. He talks to a random stagehand who's definitely not Luke Owen, and he's like, see that lady? I'm gonna have sex with her. But not Luke is like, what about Nydia? And Jamie's like, what about Nydia? The payoff to this, by the way, comes to us on SmackDown the following Thursday when Jamie is gonna have his big night with Tori. He's so excited. But then as the night goes on, Nydia shows up and she's upset. Billy Gunn shows up and he's upset. And by the end, these four are all stooping each other. It's a big old four-way. Love reigns supreme only on SmackDown. Oh, wrestling. Up next, the WWE Tag Team Championship is on the line. You got Shelton Benjamin and Charlie Haas, formerly of Team Angle, now calling themselves the world's greatest tag team. And boy, did that name stick for them or what? Taking on the Cruiserweight Champion, Rey Mysterio, and his on-again, off-again through the years partner, Billy Kidman. Rey, like I said, is the Cruiserweight Champ going into this as well. And they do a really good job in commentary in the build up for this match and the match itself, talking about the history that these two have as tag team partners, how they used to be tag partners in WCW. They were tag team champions as part of the Filthy Animals. Hearing Michael Cole reference the Filthy Animals is something I never would have expected. And also don't forget, they were the second ever WCW Cruiserweight Tag Team Champions. The challengers are off to a good start with their fast moves and such, but Ray starts taking the heat, gets launched approximately 25 feet in the air. I love the big roll up and down into the drop kick though. Kidman and Haas each tag in, get the BK bomb and a kick out. Benjamin and Haas go for the trademark leapfrog gimmick, but it's thwarted. The 619 attempt stopped as well. Ray with a big sit to the outside. Kidman with a big springboard shooting star onto everyone. What a well-timed air horn. Top rope! <laughs> Benjamin pulls Kidman into the steel ring post and he gets his back worked over for a while. We get the old referee doesn't see the hot tag spot. Classic. Benjamin goes for a power bomb, but we all know you don't power bomb. Ki oh, wait, never mind. That, that one worked. But then Shelton goes for another one, and we all know you don't power bomb Kidman twice. Hot tag to Ray. He's flying all over the place. Really interesting moment watching this show where Ray's about to hit the 619, and the second before he does, the crowd just gets really quiet for a second. <laughs> I wonder if it was some weird sound mixing choice in, in post-production, putting it on the network or Peacock or whatever, or if that was a genuine moment where a lot of the people in the audience like held their breath with anticipation before the big move in the pot, because if it's the latter of the two, that's pretty awesome. The match is won, but the referee is distracted. Kidman giving Ray the alley-oop into Haas. Hurricane Rana, oh so close, but a kick out. Ray gets on Charlie's shoulders as a blind tag. Shelton comes at him with a springboard takedown off the shoulders. Cover and the win. 
World's Greatest Tag Team remain the champs. I give this one four and a half stars out of five. Another great match on the night. And this the, the chemistry and the pace with these four guys was incredible. Just top-notch stuff. And I think it's great that with Kidman and Mysterio, who have history in another company as a tag team, for them to be brought back in a way for this pairing here against a World's Greatest Tag Team and for it to stay so over and stay so popular and successful and like it works. Like, I love that. And so, yeah, these four guys did a great job. And this is a really, really fun tag team match. Great test for World's Greatest Tag Team as they're still kind of in that post team angle phase and really getting themselves over in a big way here. Cole and Taz do some banter between matches. At this point, Cole calling his fans the coal miners for what has to be the first time, right? Up next, it's a no count out cat fight as SmackDown GM Stephanie McMahon takes on Sable. Hey, remember how wild the storyline with Stephanie and Vince and Trish Stratus was in 2001? Well, here's the entire angle over again basically only now Sable is in Trisha's place and wow 1999 Sable must think this is a trip huh yes Vince has gone full evil incarnate by this point maybe partially possessed we don't know but he's definitely at one of his most sinister points here he hires Sable to be Stephanie's assistant and openly cavorts with her not even hiding it like he was as Trish back in the day Stephanie has a problem with this she and Sable have come to blows and Vince is like I'm evil so he makes her wrestle Sable we even get kind of a spiritual successor to the infamous slop scene from the Trish and Stephanie rivalry in 2001 where Trish beats up Steph and dumps the mysterious like brown goop on her and everything. So we get kind of a repeat of that here in the skybox of an arena where Stephanie sneaks in dressed as an attendant, pours wine on Sable, gets her ass kicked and covered in food. The noises Stephanie is making is ridiculous, but this time Stephanie fights back. Boom! That's character development, baby! The fight begins on the outside with a big brawl. Steph is just beating the hell out of Sable early on, but the Hellcat, as she is called, hits a drop kick on Stephanie's head to take over. Big kicks to Stephanie's back, getting worked over. Finally, Steph puts up the elbow, starts taking over again. That famous Irish McMahon temper, as they call it on commentary. Steph grabs a chair, but the ref takes it away. Stephanie with a slap, continuing the assault. Stephanie rips Sable's top. The referee gets in between them. Brian Hebner offering Sable his shirt. Then out of nowhere, A-Train comes in and just blasts Stephanie. Good God almighty, she took all that one. Sable pins and wins. One of the best calls Taz ever has here tonight, saying Brian Hebner has been taking those supplements. Body by Birdseed, Cole! I give it a half star out of five just for the Albert run-in because that was perfection. I totally forgot that was going to happen in this match, and then when it did, I just about left my seat because it was such an amazing, just uh, you, almost blinking you miss it, how fast Albert came in and got out of the ring. That was incredible. But besides that, it was just, you know, think of Stephanie and Trish from 2001, but now it's just Stephanie and Sable, and it's basically the same thing. And then Albert runs Stephanie over. Well, up next is the match I wish we got more of looking like this at WrestleMania 34 as The Undertaker takes on a young John Cena. It's old school versus new school, biker culture versus hip hop culture. Who will win? It wasn't too long ago that a young John Cena debuted and earned the respect of The Undertaker, but that was then, this is now. Cena's a white rapper these days and he demands respect, calls himself one of the most respected veterans on SmackDown while showing none for anyone else. The dead man saying, sometimes people need to learn the hard way. Some great promos by Cena in the build here, doing these pre-taped bits in cemeteries where he's peeing on a grave, does a rap within a flaming pentagram, very memorable stuff here, and probably some of the most iconic moments of John Cena's young career, doing these raps, you know, very, very vivid imagery here, and I think this really, really helped propel John Cena's white rapper gimmick at the time into a new level, and the fact that he's working with The Undertaker and being seen as a threat, I think also really helps. Cena's opening rap here, he rhymes, pieces with feces. Clever. It's very much the dead man in the early going here, but after a couple of minutes, Cena with the mouth full of water to distract for all of two seconds. Also, I just noticed that Cena and Jamie Noble both wear Tommy Hilfiger shorts. Missed opportunity for a tag team there. Taker just beating the hell out of Cena so far in this match. Hits the old school, and hey, it's not too often I get to call it that here. A big old choke slam, the cover, and oh, we go and scoo. Cena avoids the last ride and hits a DDT. He undoes a turnbuckle pad. Taker throwing what Cole describes as a Tyson-like punch. Sure thing, Cole. Cena lures Taker into the exposed turnbuckle, throws him into the barricade, and is back on top. Taker bleeding from the mouth, but he's able to come back. Tombstone attempt, FU attempt, we get a big boot. Both men exhausted at this point. Cena grabs his chain and decks Taker in the tum-tum, hits the FU, and we get a kick out. Cena hitting those corner punches, leading to the last ride! The last ride! Taker wins.
I give it three and a half stars out of five, and this match was way better than I thought it was going to be going in. I forgot how this one was going to go, but seeing this young Cena, he's still pretty green around the gills, but he had a darn good match, a darn good fight with The Undertaker, and the fact that he looked so competitive and so like, really having Taker on the ropes near the end of this match, I think really did wonders for him. He looked really good. I think this was a very good test for John Cena here, and you know, it's too bad we never got many more matches between them, if any. I mean, we certainly got none on pay-per-view after this. I don't think it's maybe for a tag team match that they were in, but yeah, I mean, talk about a missed opportunity to get a real John Cena Undertaker feud as elder statesman. We almost could have maybe got that in New Orleans a few years ago, but yeah, it's too bad we didn't get that because you could have really built off something like this and say, hey, look how much both men have changed, but obviously that was more for fantasy booking on the online sphere, not in the real world because that would be silly. Well, folks, this next match is going to be wild as Mr. McMahon takes on Zach Gowan. Yes, folks, Gowan is WWE's one-legged superstar. Real big inspirational story here, but a few months before this, he debuted as a fan at ringside, big old fan of Mr. America, who, of course, is Hulk Hogan in a mask. And he was kind of the third, or I guess fifth wheel in the storyline here as Vince and uh, Mr. America feuded for a while. And then uh, Mr. America, Hulk Hogan, pieced out over a combination of creative differences and pay dispute, or the WrestleMania bonus, allegedly. And so on his way out, Vincent Mann kind of buried Hogan. He showed the footage of him unmasking. And so that was kind of their, their out, so to speak, to finally show that Vince was right and that Mr. America was Hogan all along. So he gives him this big public burial and a firing on his way out. So that was the way, that, that, that's how they put the bow on the Mr. McMahon, Mr. America storyline. But hey, Zach Gowan is still hanging around here and we, we have something to do with him, apparently. Zach wants a wrestling contract, but Vince just belittles the hell out of him, calling him a freak and a cripple. He and Sable make fun of him. It's really just hard stuff to watch. Zach finally gets a shot when he and Stephanie McMahon are in a match against the Big Show. And thanks to Brock Lesnar and Kurt Angle, Gowan hits the big moonsault to win the match and get a contract. Vince responds by making his first official match against the most ruthless two-legged son of a bitch in the history of the planet himself. And Vince says, you may have survived cancer, but you won't survive me. Wow! This is the second match of the evening that features the referee issuing rules before the match, but this one's not even for a championship. Vince overpowers Zack for a lot of the match, lots of body slams and clotheslines. Taz popping huge for Gowan as he keeps fighting here, throwing elbows and such. Taz's energy in particular, by the way, I really want to put over in the Gowan matches. This one and the one he had to win the contract. I tell you, his energy is just stellar putting over Gowan, and his wonderment and the awe that he feels when he sees Gowan performing here, I don't know if it's a put on or what, but it feels genuine and it definitely is infectious, kind of radiates through the screen, makes me feel kind of like inspired seeing Zach do this stuff. It's really good work here by Taz. I got to give him his props. Gowan dumps Vince to the outside, then hits a picture perfect acai moonsault. Gowan goes on a run, hits a springboard dropkick to the dome. Vince takes over and working over Gowan's legs, slamming into the mat. Makes sense. A single leg Boston Crab gets us a rope break. Zach making the miraculous comeback, giving McMahon ring postitis. Multiple slams into the post, following up with a really bad looking bulldog. Think Jackie Gay the style. Vince grabs a chair from the outside with evil intentions, then just sets himself up to get hit in the face with it. Boy, that felt natural. Vince is busted open hard way and immediately has a gusher. He is a bloody, bloody mess. Gowan going for kind of a Phoenix splash, but he misses it. Vince rolls over him and pins to win. Gowan gets up with a standing ovation from the crowd, but man, what a bizarre end to that match. Um, three stars, I guess. I don't know how to rate a match like this because it was very like once as like 80% Vincent Mann here. Gowan doing so much near the end and then for it to end the way it did was so bonkers. Vince, like I seem to remember Vince like getting a gusher and then they wrestled for like several more minutes after this. No, it happens, like, the finish happens right away. You can see in the replay that the, the edge of the chair hits him right in the back of the head and that's what causes it. But like Vince getting down and just taking a knee apropos of nothing just kind of came out of nowhere. I'm gonna set myself up to get hit with a chair pal like it was so obvious but again the story that they told of this Vince and Zach dynamic it was so well done despite the sloppiness at the end there that I mean like I said I was sucked into it I believed it I thought it was just a really good character work by both I think Zach did a good job being that kind of defenseless kid against this mega this e egomaniacal evil person who just like has thrown his weight around with him I think it really worked here but yeah Vince 
Vince bleeding all over the place out of nowhere was certainly a different touch to it. By the way, if you want to hear more about what happened with Zach Gowan's run in WWE, you can always check out my review of that, which is right here. Backstage, Josh Matthews tracks down Eddie Guerrero and asks if he thinks the win is tainted. Eddie's saying what happened out there was Benoit's fault because with friends like Rhino, who needs enemies, says he doesn't need friends because his only friend is a title on his shoulder. Great passion from Eddie in this promo. Again, hard to believe he's the heel because he's so uh, passionate and his energy uh, makes you kind of want to root for him. So yeah, they're going to turn him baby face officially at least not too long from now. In our main event, it's a triple threat match for the best belt. I will hear no arguments on it for the WWE Championship as Brock Lesnar defends against Kurt Angle and the Big Show. Kurt Angle has come back from neck surgery after somehow getting through his match with Brock at WrestleMania 19. He is wrestling again in June after his quite revolutionary neck surgery at the time. So Kurt's a baby face. He's got respect for Lesnar and thanks him for being a friend to him during his rehabilitation. They're buds together. They're drinking milk together and they're doing competitions like push-ups and whatnot. Uh, it's just a big, big friendly rivalry, big gamesmanship here with these two athletes. By the way, Brock's still a babyface here, still the conquering hero after his big win at WrestleMania 19. And hey, to show you how much they're investing in him as a babyface, get a load of this new nickname they're trying to get over. The Manster. Yeah. So Kurt wants one more shot at the gold. Brock wants to give it to him, but the bad old Big Show wants a title shot as well. They're really pushing him as a threat. He's beaten the other two guys in singles matches lately. Angle and Lesnar want to start off on show early, but he shakes him off. Hits a choke slam on Lesnar right away. Kurt goes for the German, but Show gets him with, as Taz puts it, the ass hit. Lesnar throwing himself at Show, but still not enough. Show hits the final cut, or as Cole calls it, there it is! Kurt Angle comes in with trash can lids, and he and Brock blast the hell out of Show with them. Show still able to hit a double suplex, but then Lesnar's hit with the double choke slam. No more friendship! F5 to Angle, F5 to Show. Kurt pulling the ref out during the count. Lesnar throwing Angle into the step and now he's bleeding. It looks like they're going to set up another superplex between Lesnar and Show, which last time broke the ring. But Brock hits not just a powerbomb, a running powerbomb. Holy shit. Kurt blasts Lesnar with the chair. One right to Lesnar's face. Show boots the chair into Kurt's face. This is a man who just had neck surgery four months ago, by the way. Now Lesnar's bleeding. On the outside, Kurt with the angle slam into the Spanish announce table on Show. Angle and Lesnar go at it. More fighting on the outside. Back in the ring. Kurt with the Germans. One with a back flip. Lesnar comes back and gets the rear naked choke applied. Show comes back, hits the leg drop, covers them both and there's a kick out. A double choke slam. Brock kicks out. Lesnar breaking up the next pin. Son of a bitch! Son of a bitch! Yambag City! Kurt gets the ankle lock on Lesnar. Show tries to break it up, but he eats the angle slam. Then one to Lesnar. Kurt pins Brock to win and regain the WWE Championship. I'm gonna give this one four stars out of five. What a great main event this was. Like, it's hard for a triple threat match to be really good here, but these guys made it work. This was a car wreck of a match in the best possible way, and I loved the, the interchange these guys had throughout the match. It was really well done. I was kind of surprised that Lesnar's the one who took the fall here. This seemed like it was kind of a tailor-made for like Big Show to be there to eat the pin, to protect Lesnar if you want to put the belt on Angle again. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, I guess it sets up their rubber match down the line unless you count the Eric Angle switcheroo before Mania 19, which makes this technically the rubber match. But yeah, Brock would turn heel a little bit after this and turn heel on Kurt Angle and honestly it made sense for him to align with Mr. McMahon at that point kind of spoiler alert there because yeah babyface Brock Lesnar without Paul Heyman or a cowboy hat just doesn't work my grade for Vengeance 2003 is an A I had such a fun time watching this match not just from like a nostalgia point of view but also just my enjoyment level watching the matches themselves like they were awesome on display here just it was a kick-ass show featuring one of the best rosters WWE has ever had. It was so fun. You know, no rock, no Austin, no Edge for that matter, because he was probably poised to be a next big star before his neck injury. That wasn't a problem. I think they made up for it in a big way here, especially getting Kurt back also really helped. Man, this show was really just, it was a joy to watch. If you haven't seen it or you haven't seen it in a while, go watch it back, man, because there's a lot of fun stuff to be had on this show. Well, going into watching Vengeance for this review, I wasn't entirely sure what my next show afterward was going to be. I thought it was just going to be like a random show I kind of picked from my 
my list, no rhyme or reason to it. But then after watching this show and after watching the angle building over the weeks on TV between Vince and Stephanie, now I am just morbidly curious and I have to watch the big blow off match happening at the next SmackDown exclusive pay-per-view. So this one is on the nominations list. I am going to cover it in two weeks time. We're looking at No Mercy 2003. God help us all. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.